from the Fairmont Hotel in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering When IoT Met AI, the intelligence of things. Brought to you by Western Digital. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in downtown San Jose at the Fairmont Hotel at an interesting little show called When IoT Met AI, the intelligence of things. A lot of cool startups here along with some big companies. We're really excited to have our next guest taking a little different angle. He's Scott Noteboom. He is the co-founder and CEO of a company called Litbit. First off, Scott, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely, so for folks that aren't familiar, what is Litbit? What's kind of your core mission? Well, probably the, the simplest way to put it is, is in business, we enable our users who have a lot of experience in a lot of different areas to take their expertise and experience, which you know may not be coding software or understanding or even being able to spell what an algorithm is on the data science perspective, and being able to give them an easy interface so they can kind of create their own Siri or Alexa, an AI, but an AI that's based on their own subject matter expertise right, right. that they can put to work in a lot of different ways. So there's often a lot of talk about kind of tribal knowledge and how does tribal knowledge get passed down so people know how to do things, whether yeah. it's with new employees or or as you were talking about a little bit off camera, just remote locations or this or that. Yeah. And there hasn't really been a great system to do that. So you're really attacking that, not only with the documentation, but then making an AI actionable um, piece of software that can then drive machines and using IoT to do things, is that correct? That's right, so if you created, say, you know, an AI that I've been passionate about, because I ran data centers for a lot of years, right. is DAC. So DAC's a, an AI that has a lot of expertise in how to run a, a data center by, you know, and kind of fueled and mentored by a lot of the experts in the industry. You know, so how can you take DAC and, and put DAC to work in a lot of places, and the people who need the best trained DAC aren't you know, people who are building apps. Right. They're people who uh, have their area of subject matter expertise, and we view these AI personas that can be put to work as kind of the apps of the future, where people can subscribe to personas that are built directly by the experts, um, which is a, a pretty pure way to connect AIs with the, with the right people, right. and then be able to get them and put so, them. So, so there's kind of two steps of the process. How does the, the information get from the experts into your system? How does, yeah. how does that training kind of happen? So where we spend a lot of attention is, is you know, a lot of people question go, well an AI lives in this virtual logical world that's you know, disconnected from the physical world. And you know, I always question for you know, people to close their eyes and imagine their favorite person that, they, that loves them in the world. And when they picture that person or hear that person's voice in their head, that's actually a very similar virtual world as what AI's work in. It's not the physical world. Right, right. And what connects us as people to the physical world are our senses, our sight, our hearing, our touch, our feeling. And what we've done is, is we've enabled, using IoT sensors, the ability of combining those sensors with AI to turn sensors into senses, which then provide the ability for the AI to connect really meaningful ways to the physical world. Right. And then the experts can teach the AI this is what this looks like, this is what this sounds like, this is what it's supposed to feel like. Uh, this is, you know, if it's greater than 80 degrees in, in my office, in an office location, it's hot. Right. Really teaching the AI to be able to form thoughts based on its specific expertise, and then be able to take the right actions to, to uh, you know, to do the right things when those thoughts are formed. How do you deal with like nuance? Because I'm sure there's a lot of times where people, as you said, are sensing or smelling or something, but they don't even necessarily consciously know that that's an input into their decision process, even though it really is. They just haven't really thought of it as a discrete input. How do you, you know, kind of separate out all these kind of discrete inputs so you get a great model that represents kind of your best of breed technicians? Well, to try to answer the question, first of all, training is, the more training the better. So, you know, the good way to think of the AI is unlike a lot of technologies, that typically age and, and go out of life over time. And AI continuously gets smarter. The more it's mentored by people, which would be supervised learning, right. and the more it can adjust and learn on its own, combined with real kind of day-to-day -day data activity, combined with that supervised learning and unsupervised learning approach. Right. So, you know, enabling it to continuously get better over time. But, uh, you know, we've learned, we've figured out some ways that you know it can produce some pretty meaningful results with a small amount of training. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And then what are some of the applications that you're, you know, kind of your initial go to market? So we're a small startup, and really, what we've done is we've developed a a, a 
a platform that we really like to, our goal is for it to be very horizontal in nature. Mm -hmm. And then the applications of the AI personas can be very vertical or subject matter experts in, across different silos. So okay. what we're doing is, is we're working with partners right now in different silos uh, developing AIs that have expertise in the oil and gas business, in the pharmaceutical space, in the data center space, in the corporate facilities managed space, okay. and really making sure that people who aren't technologists in all of those space, relative, you know, whether you're a very specific scientist who's running a lab or a facilities guy in a, in a corporate building, can successfully make that exp kind of experiential connection between themselves and the AI okay. and put it to practical use. And then as we go, um, there's a lot of efforts that can you know, be very specific to specific silos, whatever they may be. So those personas are, are actually roles of, of, of individuals, if you will, performing certain tasks within those verticals. Absolutely, and what we call them as co-workers and the way things are designed is, is just like, you know, one of the things that I think is really important in the AI world is that we approach everything from a human perspective mm -hmm. because it's a big disruptive shift and people, you know, there's a lot of concern over it. So if you get people to connect to it in a humanistic way, right. like, you know, coworker Viv works along with coworker Sophia and, you know, Viv has this expertise, Sophia has this expertise and, you know, has better improving ways to interface with people who have names that aren't a lot different than them and have skill sets that aren't a lot different. It's right. just you know, when you look at the AIs, um, you know, they don't mind working longer hours, you know, let them work the weekends so I right. can spend hours with my family, let right. them work the crazy shifts and, um, you know, so things are, are different in that regard, but, but the relationship aspect of, of how the workplace works, um, try not to disrupt that too much. Right, right. And then, so then on the consumption side with the, co the, 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 the person coworker that's working with the persona, yeah. how do they interact with it? How do they get the data out? And I guess more, even more importantly, maybe how does they get, you know, the new data back in to continue to train yep. the model? So the biggest thing you have to focus on with a human and machine learning interface that doesn't require a program or a data science is that the language that the AI is taught in is human language, natural human language. So we developed a lot of natural human language files that are pretty neat because, you know, a human coworker in, you know, California here could be interfacing in English to their coworker. And at the same time, you know, someone speaking Mandarin in Shanghai could be interfacing with the same coworker, you know, speaking Mandarin. Right. And thus you can get multilingual functionality. Right now, to answer your question, uh, people are doing it in a text-based scenario. Okay. But the future vision, I think when the industry timing is right, is we view that every one of the coworkers we're developing will have a very distinct, unique fingerprint of a voice. Right. So therefore, when you're engaging with your coworker using voice, you'll begin to recognize oh that's Dax or right. that's Viv or that's right. Sophia based on their voice so like many people were uh, very pro you know this is how we're communicating with voice and we believe the same thing is going to occur and uh, you know a lot of that's in timing and uh, but that's that's the direction we're thinking right about interesting the, the whole voice aspect is just a whole nother interesting thing in terms of what type of voice personality attributes associated with voice and you know, that's probably going to be a huge piece in terms of the adoption, in terms of having a, a, a true coworker experience, yeah. if you will. Well, like it's fun. One of the things we haven't figured out, and you know, these are important questions, and there's so many unknowns. Is we feel really confident that you know the you know the AI persona should have a unique voice because then I know who I'm engaging with, and I can connect in with it by ear without them saying what their name is. But what does an AI persona look like? That's something where actually we don't know that and we explore different things and oh, that looks scary or oh, that doesn't make sense. Should it look like anything? Uh, which has largely been the approach of, you know, what does an Alexa or a Siri look like? Right, right. But, uh, you know, as you continue to advance those engagements and particularly when augmented reality comes into play, when, through augmented reality, if you're able to look and say, oh, a coworker is working over there, right. there's some value in that, but what is it gonna look like? That's interesting and we don't know that. Yeah, too. hopefully better than those things at the San Jose airport that are running around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Your classic robot. Exactly. All right, Scott, well, it, very interesting yeah. story. I look forward to watching you uh, to grow and develop over time. Awesome, it's good to talk. Absolutely, all right, he's Scott Nopeloom. He's from LitBit, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE, We're, when I would team at AI. The Intelligence of Things here in San Jose, California. We'll be right back after this short break. Thanks for watching.